Welcome back to Questing Beast. Today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at my own game, Maze Rats. I did a short overview of this game previously, but I haven't done an in-depth look through it, looking at what sets it apart, what makes it unique, some of the special features that you can use for your own game, even if you don't like this particular system. You may notice that it is in pamphlet form. The last version I did was just um, pieces of paper, just two page spreads that you had to print out, but I've rearranged the PDF so that you can simply print it out double-sided, fold it over, and then staple the spine, and you have yourself your own little pamphlet. So if you've already downloaded it, you can head back to Drive Through uh, RPG, and you can re-download the files, and you will get this new version of it. You can print out a pamphlet yourself. I printed out the cover on thicker cardstock because it made it a little bit tougher, but you can print it out however you want. So what makes Maze Rats special? So it is a old school role-playing game in the sense that it is focused on uh, ease of use, is focused on being fast, being deadly, and focused on making the players think outside the box. And I'll, we'll look through how it does that. I have a quick introduction on how the game works. Um, the game works with something called danger rolls, which are essentially saving throws. I've renamed them danger rolls, though, because you only use them when you're in danger. You don't use them to solve most problems. You roll two dice. It's a 2d6 system, so you're going to be using these little guys for everything. And you roll 2d6, you add your strength, your dexterity, or your will, and you try and get a 10. So statistically, that is usually unlikely, unless you gain advantage. So you roll a danger roll when you have to, when you're in danger, but you want to avoid doing so whenever possible, which means you're going to have to think outside the box to avoid being in those kinds of dangerous situations. You also can get advantage. That just means roll three dice and use the two highest if you have a situational advantage of some sort. We have a simple NPC reaction system, which is pretty standard for old school games where you can roll a die and see how they are disposed to you. This gives a little bit more flavor and variety because even the GM is not going to be completely sure how the NPCs are going to react. Or you can just use it when he's unsure. We have initiative, which is group initiative. So one side does all of their moves, then the other side does all of theirs. Uh, combat works al uh, along the same lines as the danger rolls. It just means you roll two dice, you add your attack bonus, if any, and then you try and get over their armor. And if you get over their armor, you deal damage equal to the difference. So there's no need to actually roll damage dice. This cuts out one step from combat and makes it run faster, which is something I like. If the defender has a shield, you can shatter it to ignore all damage. That's something called uh, shields shall be splintered. It's an old uh, rule I've seen floating around the internet. It's very common. And uh, it's a lot of fun because it gives the players um, an incentive to use a shield. They're less likely to just use two-handed weapons when a shield is that useful. Uh, NPC, NPC morale system. This allows the GM to throw big groups of enemies at the, the players. Because if they whittle them down enough, or if they frighten them enough, the NPC's morale might break, and they might run for it. Uh, simple healing system. Encumbrance system is pretty free form. Uh, belts can hold two items. Backpacks can hold as much as a backpack couldn't reasonably carry. So it relies on some GM adjudication there. Um, and then you can have your hands can hold two things. Leveling up, you gain one, two, or three experience points after each session. And if you gain enough XP, then you can level up. So one of the things that I really like about Maze Rats, and a lot of people have told me they like, is the character creation system, which makes fairly detailed, interesting people with very little time and effort involved. In fact, you can randomize the whole thing if you want. In fact, I'm going to do just that. Once I finish going through this uh, book, we're going to take a look at how to randomly generate an, a uh, player character, and you'll see how easy it is. So um, all of the tables in this book, and this book is mostly made out of tables, are D36. What that means is that you roll two dice. For example, I got a three and a two. This means group three, item two. So here I have six groups. I would go group three, item two, that would produce the result gaunt. Or if I had clothing over here, roll two dice, got a five and a five, one, two, three, four, group five, 
Item five, their clothing is practical. So we have magic. The magic system allows you to randomly generate spells. There is a system built into Maze Rats that uses this, this uh, random generation, but you can use this in any game that you want. If you're running a typical D&D game and you just want some crazy magical effects, you can easily generate your own magic using this. I have a table for mutations, which is great for when spells go wrong. Uh, insanities, um, omens and magical catastrophes. I have a monster generation system. So you can create aerial animals, terrestrial or aquatic animals, or some combination of the three by rolling on more than one table. Monster features, these are just um, parts of an animal, like fangs, fur, gills, and so on. You can also use it for potion ingredients, or you can craft them into items. You can sell them to people. Uh, a merchant might ask you to go out and find the scales of a particular animal. Monster traits and monster abilities. These are the more unusual things that make an animal uh, special and set them apart. These ones tend to be more ordinary, and these are the strange, more magical things. Monster tactics. I got this idea from Godbound, and what it does is it allows every monster to act in a different way. You can simply roll on the table, and your monster is going to um, have unique tactics that are going to help the GM know how to run it. Personality of your monster, if it's intelligent, and a monster weakness. These, of course, are optional, but they can be a lot of fun. And we have two whole pages for characters. This is for NPCs. Though, of course, you can use these tables for your player character, too, if you feel like it. Civilized uh, piece NPCs, we have Underworld and Wilderness, the three main areas where you're going to run into characters. Uh, random names. Now, the names, of course, um, are just names that I liked. You can replace them with whatever you want. Uh, the surnames are interesting. I mostly stole them off of lists of surnames that have died off. So there's a mostly English last names that have become extinct. And as a result, they sound, they sound English. They sound like real names, but they sound a little strange too, because you've never met anyone with that name. Um, assets. So things that make the NPC useful to the PC and makes you, makes that your players want to make them, uh, make a friend of them and liabilities. So you can give one of these to a villain and they will have a weakness that you can try and exploit. Every NPC should have a goal, of course, um, misfortunes that have happened to them, missions. This is a great way to generate new uh, missions for your players, new adventures. All right, so you can have an NPC ask your players to, let's roll one. Ooh, one, one. So apprehend someone, right? They become, uh, maybe they're deputized to make an arrest. Or, let's see, five, four, they need to retrieve something or surveil something, takes a place over, terrorize someone, threaten someone. Lots of different opportunities for adventure. And here we have even more details, methods that the NBC uses to get things done. Their general appearance, their details, clothing, personalities, mannerisms. A lot of these are replicated on uh, near the front of the book for player character creation. But I reproduce them back here just for the sake of completion. Secrets that they have, they're not what they say they are what their reputation is in the community, any unique hobbies they have, relationships. This is very important to creating uh, communities of people. That way you can roll up some relationships between them and you'll have an interconnected set of NPCs, which tends to be more fun to interact with. Divine domains, so if you want to create some gods after the party, this is your, um, your table for rolling on when your players have maybe too fun of a night. So something, they're going to wake up the next morning and something crazy has happened. Great for adventure hooks. Treasure and equipment. So we have a little bit of a treasure generation system. Miscellaneous items, items that you wear, weapons, books. So book subjects. Uh, this is a way that you, if your players pull a random book off the shelf, you can tell them what it's about. And, they, and you uh, roll one die and it tells you how many questions it can answer on that subject. So that's an idea I stole from Vornheim. Uh, random tools. These are, of course, always useful in old school games because you'll be messing around with your environment and trying to build things and take things apart. 
um, potion effects, magical ingredients that you can use to combine to make uh, your potions, uh, treasure items, traits, and valuable materials. So you can combine these three, roll on them to make something unusual. Let's try something. Let's get a random treasure item. All right, six, one. So it's a type of silverware. What is special about it? What's its trait? Three, five. So it's gold silverware. Oh, sorry, that's the materials. So it's gold silverware. What's its trait? Let's roll on that. Three, two, embellished. So it's gold silverware that probably has some um, designs etched into it. But you have all sorts of strange things that you can have too. Uh, it draws enemies to you. It's owned by someone else. It was created by a non-human. And you have weird materials like coral, cinnabar, platinum, porcelain, that things can be made of. Give your treasure more flavor. We have random tables for cities. So the theme of your city, uh, major events that are happening, this is a great way to make your city come together. Um, if you have a major city event happening, then all of the NPCs in the city are going to be talking about it and reacting to it, so it'll be easier to run the city. Uh, the different districts can have their own themes if you want to make the city uh, easier to run because the different parts of it, the players know what they're going to get when they go there. They know that this is the industrial um, uh, district in the city or the one focused on judgment or poverty or science. It'll give them more choices and more agency when moving around a city. We have upper class buildings, lower class buildings, city activities. Oh, by the way, some of these are in bold. What that means is that it refers you to another table to roll on. So a lot of these tables are interconnected and get more and more complex as you choose to combine them. We have rooms inside your buildings, tactical street features. So if you have an encounter on the street, there's gonna be things that are getting in the way and making the encounter more interesting. Like clotheslines, a crowd, the, the street is flooded, there's food stalls, there's vermin swarms, and tactical building features. This is great for if you're running heists. So the building is not just one room after another, there's features in it that you can use to disguise yourself, you know, to hide from enemies, to make ambushes and so on, or shortcuts. Factions, of course you need factions in a city. You have 36 different types of factions that you can embellish with some faction traits and add a faction goal. And you have a fleshed out faction ready to go. We have the wild, general regions, landmarks in the region and structures built um, in different parts of the wild. So the different regions can have traits and that's connected to that. If you roll them two together, you get something interesting. So for example, let's pick a region, 6-4. It's a volcanic plain. And what is its trait? 6-4 again. Ooh, a physical effect. So I got a bold one. So I'd refer back to physical effects, which is in magic. So what is this volcanic plain like? 5-6. It's a transmuting volcanic plain. So maybe it's belching lava, but that shifts to something else periodically. We have wilderness discoveries. That's your general encounters that you're going to happen, that you're going to have in the wild. Activities, things that are happening. If you run into some people, what's going on with them? Makes the wilderness a little more active. We have hazards that you're going to run into. Uh, edible and poisonous plants, if your players are into foraging. And inns, of course. You can't uh, have a wilderness adventure without running into inns along the road. This is to generate their names. This is always fun. Let's generate an inn name. 6-1. The smoking, get a noun, two, two, the smoking candle. Yeah, that actually makes sense. Or you can even run, uh, roll two nouns back to back. For example, two, four, the cow, and three, three, the cow and fork is the name of that inn. And we've got an inn quirk. So the cow and fork, what is special about this inn? Six, one, all of the staff are kids. There you go. The maze, this is of course your dungeon generation. Every dungeon needs a cool entrance. It's gonna have an interesting form, so it's not just gonna necessarily be a maze of corridors. It might be um, an ancient buried bathhouse, or a casino, or a monastery. It's gonna have a strange layout, for example, a honeycomb structure. It's gonna be all curved, dis disorienting. There might be no corridors in it. There might be recursive. There's gonna, always gonna be a reason why the dungeon became a dungeon, what ruined it. We're going to have rewards that you're going to get for going through your dungeon, what's going on in your dungeon to make it a more active place. We have your types of rooms, your details, 
the dungeon tricks. So these are the strange rooms that aren't necessarily traps, but are going to give your players something interesting to work with. Maybe it's a puzzle, maybe it's some strange effect that they're going to have to figure out. We have your typical hazards. These are more natural hazards that you would find in a dangerous underground lair. And trap effects. This is for generating traps. Combine it with a trigger so that you know what's going to set it off and you've got something interesting. For example, let's roll a trap here. Six, five, the tombs open when something happens. What's the trigger here? Five, five, when you sit down on something. Maybe you sit down on the tomb, it opens up. And I have the Game Master's Guide. So I have a sample game. It's just one page long, and it goes through most of the mechanics. And then we also are going to have uh, se uh, three sections, prepping a session, running a game, and building the world that are going to cover how I intend the game to be run. Though you can use the tools in this however you want, obviously. So I have some basic uh, old school principles. I have advice for running the game um, and building the world. So if you've never created your own campaign before or you're interested in creating a more open hex crawl sandbox type game, there's some good advice here. And you can use all the tables, of course, to help fill that in and make it really easy for you. Of course, at the back of the book, we have some character sheets that you can photocopy. And that's it. That's the whole game. It's a short little package. It is pay what you want on DriveThruRPG. Um, if you've got it already, you can re-download it in this pamphlet form. If you haven't yet, go ahead and give it a shot. Um, I'd appreciate a tip if you can afford it. But if not, hey, you know what? I want you guys to play it. So if you play it, tell me how it goes. Um, that's it for this time. My next video is going to be randomly generating a Maze Rats character. So you can hang around and look at that. And you can check out my other videos. You can join me on Patreon if you'd like to support me. And subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you guys later.